For chapter 12, we're going to be discussing water and the major minerals. Starting off with water, water is a very important part of the body. The majority of our body is actually composed of water, so it has lots of different roles. It's going to act as a lubricant for your different body parts. It helps transport your nutrients and your wastes. It makes up the blood that transports your nutrients. It makes up the urine that releases the wastes. It also helps you regulate your temperature like we discussed in the uh, fitness chapter. So it has lots of roles. And so we need to make sure that we are getting enough water and that the water balance in our body is correct as well. So starting off with the outward water balance, which is making sure that we get enough water. We want to make sure that we are putting enough water into our body to replace what our body loses on a regular basis. That includes things like sweating, urine, stool, etc. that you lose water through on a daily basis. And if you don't replace what your body is losing, you're going to end up with dehydration, which if you remember we said is first felt through thirst. Thirst is the very first sign of dehydration. So you don't want to wait until you're thirsty because once you feel thirsty, that means you're already dehydrated. You want to make sure that you are consuming water on a regular basis and not just waiting until you feel thirsty. Now, we mentioned that the very first sign of dehydration is thirst, but let's go ahead and take a look at what happens if you don't consume water as soon as you feel thirsty. You allow the dehydration to continue. Um, some of the things that can happen. So we have things like fatigue, weakness, impaired physical performance, um, impatience, difficulty concentrating, difficulty sleeping, your temperature has a hard time regulating itself, and eventually you could lead to dizziness ex and exhaustion. So something can, uh, something very basic can turn into something a lot more serious if you don't correct it as soon as you feel the thirst. Now as for where we're going to get our water from, obviously we can drink straight old water, but water is also in other beverages and foods as well. So for example, things like your juice, your milk, those kind of beverages, you'll notice that the first ingredient is usually water because the majority of the fluid is water. It's primarily composed of water. So that does count towards your intake. We also have a lot of foods that are composed of water as well. So you do have some water from those foods and beverages contributing to your intake, but obviously you want to make sure that you are drinking straight water as well to maintain your hydration. Now we mentioned um, two of the things that are going to count towards our water intake. Our water intake is what you're seeing on the left and on the right is what we're trying to replace. So for example we said you're losing things through your urines, your sweat, etc. And so we're trying to make sure that we are uh, putting in as much fluid as we're losing. And we talked about the left hand side where we're going to get some water from the beverages we drink, the foods we eat, but we also get water from metabolism in our body. If you remember, we said anytime our body joins two things together, it's going to do it through condensation. And condensation is the creation of water. So anytime that happens in your body, you are creating water that counts towards your intake as well. Now there are certain recommendations as for what type of water you want to consume besides just making sure that you consume enough, we want to make sure you're consuming the right type. And the two ways that we can categorize water is hard water versus soft water. This is categorizing water based off of its mineral content. Hard water contains primarily calcium and magnesium. Soft water contains primarily sodium. So the hard water is going to be the one that we want to drink because sodium is something that we already consume way too much of. 
too much sodium is what leads to high blood pressure and we already have a big issue with that in the US so if you imagine let's say you were drinking soft water all the time that soft water is loaded with sodium so if you can imagine every time you drink water you're raising your sodium levels even more your blood pressure would be out of control so soft water we do not want to drink we want to leave that for things like cleaning because it does make a better lather than hard water so it's good for cleaning not for drinking hard water doesn't make much of a lather and it can leave a residue on your dishes in your bathtub but it um, doesn't contain the sodium and it gives us the calcium and magnesium that we tend to lack so hard water is the recommendation for drinking and that's what comes out of our water supply out of our faucets it is hard water so now that we have down how we're going to maintain our water balance when it comes to our intake versus output we can go ahead and take a look at water balance within the body so this is referring to how much water is within your cells, how much is outside of your cells. That's something that our body uh, regulates very carefully as well. If there is an imbalance in the cells or outside of the cells, then that can cause some health issues. So let's go ahead and take a look at how this works. Now, one of the main things that is going to control the water balance, how much water is in the cell and how much is outside the cell, is the electrolytes. Electrolytes are minerals that can conduct electricity in water. The ones that have a positive charge are called cations. The ones that have a negative charge are called anions. And we're going to go ahead and take a look at how um, certain electrolytes can influence where the water is located in our body. This over here is showing us a few of the most common electrolytes, um, both cations and anions. So you'll notice that the cations are in green and the anions are in orange. So we have cations and anions both inside and outside of the cell. Now we're going to go ahead and take a look at the um, process of osmosis because this is going to help us understand how our molecules, or how the uh, minerals are going to help regulate where the water goes in our body. So let's go ahead and take a look at this over here. We start off with the beaker of water that's divided in half. Both sides of the beaker have the same amount of water and the same amount of particles. Now, if we were to go ahead and add more particles to the side B, what's going to happen is side B is going to become a lot more concentrated. And the concept of osmosis is that water will go ahead and move to the more concentrated side in order to even things out. And so that's going to be how we're going to even out the difference in concentration. You'll notice in the last uh, picture there, we now have less water inside A. And that's because the water moved from an area of low concentration to the area that is higher concentration, side B, in order to even out the ratio of water to particle. So again, osmosis is the concept of water flowing from an area of low concentration to high concentration, and the purpose of that is to even out the solvent and the solute, the fluid and the particle. So the reason we want to look at this is because this is basically what happens in our body. When we are talking about the water inside of our cells and outside of our cells, it uses the same process of osmosis. When you have um, sodium in particular, sodium is something that water will always follow. Sodium and water always go in the same direction. So if we're taking a look at this over here and 
let's pretend that this is the body's cell. So side A is outside of the cell, side B is inside of the cell. If more sodium moved to inside of the cell, side B, what happens is water will also go ahead and move into side B to balance out the ratio of sodium to water. So basically the concept is the body always tries to maintain a certain ratio of sodium to water. Water always follows sodium. So if more sodium enters a cell, more water is going to enter the cell as well. If more sodium leaves the cell, water will follow that sodium and leave the cell also, again, to maintain the ratio of sodium to water. So that's going to be the main way that sodium is going to help regulate our fluid balance, is wherever sodium goes, that's where water is going to go as well. So we now know that sodium and water go in the same direction and how that influences where the water flows in our body. So let's go ahead and take a look at how that influences our blood pressure. Let's say that you consumed something that has a lot of sodium in it. When you consume something that has a lot of sodium, all of a sudden the ratio of sodium to water in your body is going to be very, very concentrated. The body doesn't want the uh, water to be very concentrated with sodium. And so what it's going to do is instead of letting you use the restroom and release water in your urine, it's going to start retaining water because the more water that we hold onto, the more of a balance that we can create between the sodium that you just ate and the body fluids. That's why sometimes when you eat something that is salty, you feel like you get bloated. It's because your body is holding on to all of its fluids instead of releasing them like usual to create a better balance between sodium and water. So that's the first thing that can happen is when you have high levels of sodium, you're going to have more retention of water in your body. Now the water that is retained is actually going to be in your blood. Your blood is made of water and red blood cells. So the more water that you retain, the more blood that we have. We're going to have a lot more blood to pump now. And the more blood that we have to pump, the harder the heart is going to have to work to pump the blood around. So the more water retention, we have the more blood volume our body now has to pump. The more blood volume means higher blood pressure. And so that is basically how high sodium diets can lead to high blood pressure. Because the sodium causes water retention, which raises the amount of blood volume that the heart has to pump and puts extra strain on the heart. Now one other thing that I want to mention is the relationship between potassium and sodium. Potassium and sodium actually go in opposite directions. So if we take a look at this picture again, this is the one that we saw before, that shows us which minerals are cations, which are anions. One thing that you'll notice is that potassium and sodium have the same charge. Potassium is the letter K, sodium is Na, and they're both green, which means they're both positively charged. Now, if the sodium decided to go ahead and move inside of the cell, what would happen is now we would have three greens versus two orange meaning we now have a more positive charge inside of the cell. The way that the body is going to balance this out is that it's going to have to kick out something else that is positive, another cation. Because sodium is positive, it's a cation, and it came in and disturbed the charge that's in the cell. So to make room for that extra positive charge from sodium, we need to kick something else that is a positive charge. And what that is going to be is potassium. When potassium leaves, 
the inside of the cell is going to go back to having that neutral charge. That's why I mentioned that sodium and potassium always go in opposite directions. Now that we know how the electrolytes are going to work to balance the fluids inside and outside of our cell, we can go ahead and take a look at how the process is going to work in the bigger picture. So the main thing that's going to regulate our fluid is actually our kidney. The kidney is what sends urine to your bladder. So this over here is showing us a nephron. A nephron is something that is inside of your kidney. We have millions of nephrons in the kidney. So here is just one zoomed in and they're showing us how it works. So you have the blood vessel in red and then around the red blood vessel we have the yellow tube that is called a tubule. This tubule is what takes urine to your bladder. So the way that it works is the blood is going to go ahead and flow to your kidney. And remember, the blood is carrying nutrients, but it could also be carrying waste. So once it enters into the kidney and reaches the circular part of that tubule, it's called the glomerulus. What actually happens there is the blood dumps out all of its contents into the tubule. And then, while the contents are in the tubule, the kidney decides what do we want to actually keep in the body. The things that the body actually wants to hold on to, we're going to go ahead and send them back to the bloodstream. The things that we consider waste, that we want to leave the body, we're going to leave it in the tubule so that it can make its way to your bladder and be released as urine. So basically, if you want to think of it as... Um, Let's say you're cleaning your car, but instead of taking the trash out of your car, you're taking out everything out of your car and then deciding what you want to put back into the car and keep the rest out. That's what's happening here. We're dumping everything from the blood into the tubule and then deciding what we want to put back into the blood. The rest is going to be released as waste through our urine. Now, we have hormones that actually tell the kidney what to put in back into the blood and what to keep in the tubule. And the hormones that we're going to go ahead and look at today are the ones that are going to help raise our blood pressure. So we talked about how we can end up with high blood pressure because you consume too much sodium, but low blood pressure can also be a concern as well. And when we have low blood pressure, our body has certain hormones that work to help raise our blood pressure back to a healthy level. So let's go ahead and walk through the different hormones. The first one is the ADH, or antidiuretic hormone. A diuretic is something that causes you to use the restroom to release urine, and the antidiuretic is going to be the opposite of that, meaning it's going to allow your body to hold on to the water instead of releasing it through urine. And the reason we want to do this is because the more water that your body retains, the more blood volume we're going to have, which means more blood to pump and the heart is forced to work harder. That raises our blood pressure. So when your blood pressure is too low, we want to hold on to as much fluid as possible. We want the blood volume to be as high as possible because that's going to force the heart to work harder, which we need at that point. Next, we actually have an enzyme, and this en enzyme is called renin. Renin is going to do two things. The first thing that it's going to do is tell your kidney to reabsorb sodium. The reason I say reabsorb is because, remember, the kidney dumps everything from the blood into the tubule, and then it decides what it wants to reabsorb into the blood. So the, thing th the things that go from the tubule back into the blood, those are going through reabsorption. So renin is going to tell your kidney hey, we need that sodium, 
put it back in the blood so that we can keep it. Don't keep it in the tubule. Don't send it to the urine. We need it to stay. And the reason it's doing this is because, remember, water follows sodium. So this is an indirect way of telling our body to retain water. When our body holds on to sodium, as a result, our body's also going to hold on to water. The more water we hold on to, the higher the blood volume, the higher the blood pressure. Now the other thing that renin is going to do is it's going to activate another hormone in our body called angiotensin. And this hormone is really important because what it's actually going to do is constrict our blood vessels. Your blood vessels are your veins and arteries that the blood normally flows through. And what I mean by constrict is that it's going to make them a lot more narrow than they were before. If your veins and arteries are more narrow, that means the blood is basically going to be trickling through them at a slower rate than usual. And if that happens, the heart is going to have to work harder and faster to compensate and keep the blood flow the same, even though the um, passageway is a lot smaller. And so by making the blood vessels more narrow, we force the heart to pump faster and harder. The last one is also a hormone, and this is the hormone aldosterone. Now what it's going to do is it's going to tell your kidney to release potassium. So once we dump everything from the blood into the tubule and we're deciding what we want, what we want to put back into the blood, the hormone aldosterone is going to tell the kidney, keep the potassium in the tubule and let it go into the urine. We don't want that potassium back. Don't reabsorb it. Don't redeposit it into the blood. Let it go to the urine. Now, the reason for this is, remember, potassium and sodium go in opposite directions. So if we tell the body to get rid of potassium, what the body's going to do is it's going to start holding on to more sodium to maintain its charge. If we get rid of a bunch of positively charged potassium, we need to hold on to more positive charge, which is sodium. And if we hold on to more sodium, we hold on to more water, which will raise our blood pressure. So this is based off of the fact that potassium and sodium go in opposite directions. Now that we know how our body is going to maintain fluid balance, we want to go ahead and look at how we're going to maintain the pH of that fluid, in particular, the pH of our blood. This over here is showing us where blood falls on the pH scale. If you'll notice, we have on the top the basic side of the pH uh, scale, and then at the bottom we have the acidic side of the pH scale. And in the middle, we have the blood. The blood falls between a very narrow range between around 7 and 8, and they have it zoomed in for us. So when you look at the zoomed in chart on the right hand side, it shows us that the normal pH for blood is 7.35 to 7.45. If it becomes more basic, going from 7.45 to 8, that's not much of a jump, but that tiny change can lead to death. Same thing if it drops from 7.35 to 6.8, that can also lead to death. So we want to make sure that the blood remains within that very narrow pH range so that your body can function as um, efficiently as possible. The way that our body is going to maintain this very narrow range of the pH of the blood is by using what we call blood buffers. Blood buffers are uh, basically compounds that can regulate how acidic and how basic the blood is. The one that's going to make our blood more basic is bicarbonate because bicarbonate is a base and the one that's going to make our blood more acidic is carbonic acid. Now our lungs and kidneys are also going to participate in 
um, this process as well by helping us make more bicarbonate or more carbonic acid depending on what our pH level is and what our needs are. So let's go ahead and take a look at how this actually works. So let's go ahead and take a look at how these blood buffers actually work to make our blood more acidic or basic. We said that if your blood is too basic, carbonic acid will make it more acidic. And at the top here, it shows us how we form carbonic acid. Carbonic acid is made by combining carbon dioxide and water. Now, if our blood was already too acidic, we wouldn't want to make more carbonic acid. So a way that your body will fix this is by getting rid of any excess carbon dioxide. Because if you get rid of that carbon dioxide, it won't be able to combine with water and make more acid. And the way that this is going to happen is by the help of your lungs. If your blood pH is too acidic, usually what will start happening is you will start exhaling at a faster rate, kind of like hyperventilating, to release carbon dioxide out of your body at a faster rate than usual because we don't want carbon dioxide hanging around and making carbonic acid if our blood is already too acidic. Another thing that we can do when our blood is too acidic is create the other blood buffer, which is bicarbonate. And the way that we do that is by breaking down carbonic acid into an individual hydrogen and the rest forms bicarbonate. So this is going to be something that creates a base. Bicarbonate is a base, so the pH will start to become more basic. So this is going to be how our body maintains its blood pH. By increasing the carbonic acid, if our pH is too basic, or increasing the bicarbonate, if our pH is too acidic. That covers the water portion of this chapter. Now we can go ahead and take a look at the individual minerals. Now our minerals are going to be divided up into two different categories, our major and trace minerals. And that's basically referring to the amount of the mineral that is found in foods and in our body and how much we need of that mineral. So it's not telling us which ones are more important than the other. It's just a way of categorizing them based on their quantity. So this here is showing you the difference between our major and trace minerals. This is showing us how much of the mineral is found in the average human body. And you'll see that the trace minerals are practically non-existent while we have a lot more of the major minerals. So that's the only real difference between the two categories. So in this chapter, we're going to go ahead and take a look at the major minerals first, and then our next chapter will cover the trace minerals. Our first major mineral is sodium, which we already discussed. We said its primary role is going to be regulating our fluid balance, which will influence our blood pressure. But it also has other roles as well, in particular, transmitting nerve impulses and muscle contractions. Now this goes back to what we discussed before about how the charge of the cell changes when electrolytes move in and out. We said if sodium were to move inside of a cell, the charge inside of the cell becomes more positive until the body fixes that by kicking potassium out. Now in that temporary period, where now the charge has changed. The change in charge causes muscle contractions and it also causes your body to transmit nerve impulses. So this is going to be a role that we're gonna see for all electrolytes. Anything that can cause an electrical charge, which is what our electrolytes do, is going to change the charge inside of our cells when they move into and out of the cells. And once the cell has a temporary change in charge, it transmits nerve impulses and causes muscle contractions or causes your muscles to relax. 
So this is going to be a common theme that we're going to see for all of the electrolytes. And it is due to the temporary change in charge before the body balances it back out again. In the U.S., we actually get a lot more sodium than is recommended, so we're not concerned about deficiencies. We're more concerned about lowering the amount that we consume because the amount of sodium that we have in our diet is causing high blood pressure, which we call hypertension. Hypertension is just the scientific word for high blood pressure. Now, sodium is part of salt. Salt is composed of sodium chloride. And so people usually blame salt for their high blood pressure. Now, the problem with that is when they looked at where um, individuals were getting their sodium from, only a very small amount came from salt that you add at the table or salt that you add when you're cooking. The main intake of sodium actually came from processed foods. So, for example, in particular, things like canned uh, soup, canned sauces, um, frozen dinners, also things like your canned vegetables, basically anything that has a really long shelf life because sodium is something that acts as a preservative. So things like canned vegetables, canned beans, jarred spaghetti sauce, for example, those you can basically stick in your pantry forever and they're not going to go bad. And that's because of all of the sodium that's in there. And so if you do want to lower your uh, sodium levels, the best and most effective way that you can do that is by decreasing the amount of processed foods that you consume. Now there is also a special diet for people with hypertension. It is called the DASH diet. It stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. And this obviously includes decreasing um, salt, decreasing sodium intake, but it does that by focusing on an intake of fresh foods. It requires a lot more fruits and vegetables than the typical diet recommends. Also, a lot of whole grains to help you keep you full with that fiber. So it is going to be something that overall is going to help with eating healthy, eating more whole foods as opposed to processed foods, and that should help lower the sodium intake. Now this over here shows you the difference between um, the amount of sodium in fresh food versus processed food. Now another thing that I want to point out is potassium is something that is lost when we process food. Normally potassium is something that is found in fresh foods, but once that food is processed, a lot of that potassium is destroyed. So if you remember, we said that sodium and potassium go in opposite directions. So if you increase the amount of potassium that you add into your diet, you put more potassium into your body, the natural reaction is going to be that your body is going to kick sodium out of your body. Remember, opposite directions. Potassium in, sodium has to go out. So by eating more fresh foods, not only are you decreasing the amount of sodium you consume, but you're also increasing the amount of potassium you consume which will help you kick out more sodium out of your body. So let's go ahead and take a look at an example on here. One is in the meat section. We have fresh roast beef, which you'll see is primarily a purple bar. The purple is potassium. And we have hardly any sodium. But once that roast beef is processed and we make it into lunch meat, we hardly have any potassium left and the whole bar is now sodium, so it becomes loaded with sodium. Same thing goes with the vegetables. We have fresh corn that is basically all potassium, but once it's processed, it becomes mostly sodium instead. So this is just an idea to help you figure out some things that you can maybe change in your diet to help you increase potassium and decrease sodium. Now, we already know if you get too much sodium, it is going to cause high blood pressure. 
Now, if you didn't get enough sodium, um, it's going to result in a, a condition that we call hyponatremia. It just means low sodium, and that can lead to hypotension. Hypotension is low blood pressure, but this usually is not a concern. Deficiencies are pretty rare. The only time we're really concerned about this is if somebody has chronic vomiting, chronic diarrhea that continues very severely for a prolonged period. In those situations, their body is excreting a lot of fluid and sodium will usually leave with that fluid. So only in those kind of situations are we really concerned about deficiency. Otherwise, toxicity is really our main concern. The next major mineral is chloride. And the main role that I want you to know for chloride is that it helps to make hydrochloric acid. If you remember, hydrochloric acid is the HCl that is in your stomach. That's the acid that is located in your stomach that helps denature proteins. So it's a really important um, mineral because it's going to help us in the digestion of our nutrients. Now, since chloride is an electrolyte, it's also going to have those same roles that, that sodium did. It's going to also transmit nerve impulses and um, cause muscle contractions as well as regulating fluid balance as well. Now, chloride is something that we aren't really concerned about when it comes to toxicity or deficiency. Even though it is part of the salt structure, it is in processed foods, the recommendation is still pretty high. The um, upper limit is high enough that we actually don't um, develop toxicities very often. Next, we have potassium, which we again have already discussed. We know that it helps to maintain fluid balance by swapping places with sodium. It helps transmit our nerve impulses and muscle contraction. And it's also going to be really important for regulating our blood pressure. We said that potassium is going to come from our fresh foods. So when you are not consuming enough fresh foods, that's going to be when you're going to be concerned about not getting enough potassium. And if you don't have enough potassium, what's going to happen is your body is going to hold on to more sodium. Again, remember, potassium and sodium go in opposite directions. So the more potassium that um, you consume, the less sodium your body has to hold on to. But if you're not putting much sodium into your body, then your body needs to hold on to something else that has a positive charge, which is going to be sodium. So once you start increasing the potassium you put in your body, your body no longer feels like it has to hold on to so much sodium and it can go ahead and kick some of it out, which will help lower your blood pressure. The next major mineral is calcium. Now calcium is something that is found primarily in our bones. We have about 99% of the calcium in our bones, giving our bones that hard structure. But we also do have some calcium in our bloodstream as well. And that's also very important. The calcium that's in our bones and teeth actually crystallizes and forms a really hard structure called hydroxyapatite. And that's something that is going to give the bones and teeth strength and prevent it from breaking down. The calcium in our blood is going to have those same roles as we discussed with other electrolytes. So when calcium enters a cell, it's going to change the charge of the cell, which is going to transmit nerve impulses and cause our muscles to contract. It also is going to help with the blood clotting process when you have some kind of injury and you need your blood to clot. Now, the amount of calcium that's in the blood is actually very, very little, but the body actually puts the blood calcium as a priority over your bone calcium. What I mean by that is if you are low on calcium, 
the body will make sure that the blood has what it needs first and then it will worry about your uh, bone calcium or if you don't have enough and you're not putting any more into your body what your uh, body will do is it will break down your bones and take the calcium from your bones to put it into your blood now before we go on to looking at how calcium affects your bones one thing that I do want you to know is the process of bone turnover we discussed this a little bit in the previous chapter we said your bones go through somewhat of a turnover process similar to your muscles where the bones are going to undo the structure and then rebuild the bone structure so that it is healthy strong bone this is something that is constantly happening and there are certain cells that are responsible for this the cells that are called osteoclasts are the ones that undo the bone or break down the bone and then the ones called osteoblasts are the ones that are going to rebuild that bone structure and this is something that usually is going to be in balance they work together to make sure that you are constantly replenishing your bones and keeping your bones healthy let's go ahead and take a look at uh, how our body is going to make sure that our blood has enough calcium since we said that is the body's priority so we're going to go ahead and look at this diagram one side at a time once you understand one side you'll easily be able to figure out the other one so let's start with the purple so the purple side is what is going to happen when your blood calcium is too low the first thing that will happen is your parathyroid hormone is going to be released and it's going to start stimulating the activation of vitamin D remember vitamin D is really important for the calcium absorption in your body without vitamin D we can't absorb calcium but in order for vitamin D to do that it first needs to be activated so the parathyroid hormone is going to start the activation of vitamin D so that it can help out after that the vitamin D and parathyroid hormone are going to stimulate calcium reabsorption in the kidneys remember when we say reabsorption in the kidneys this is referring to the tubule redepositing the nutrient back into the blood so basically the hormone and vitamin D are telling the kidney hey we need that calcium we're running low on calcium don't leave it in the tubule don't let it go out to the urine put it back in the blood we need to keep it in the body after that vitamin D is going to start enhancing the amount of calcium that we absorb it's going to start making more of that calcium binding protein that we said is necessary for calcium to be absorbed lastly if we still don't have enough calcium for, for the blood we're going to have to resort to getting calcium from our bones and that's not something that we want to have to do because that means breaking down our bone structure but if we don't have enough calcium at this stage that's going to be our last ditch effort where we're going to start stimulating the osteoclast cells remember osteoclasts are what undo the bone structure vitamin D and the parathyroid hormone are going to start uh, making the osteoclast work harder and faster so that we have more bone breakdown and the calcium that was making the bone structure is then going to be released and deposited into the blood so that covers what happens when we don't have enough calcium so let's go ahead and take a look at the other side which shows us what is going to happen if we have too much calcium in the bloodstream so the green side is actually the exact opposite of the purple side so if you have the purple side down all you have to do is reverse the action and you have the green side down the only new thing that you have to memorize is the name of the hormone that is going to lower the blood calcium and that is called calcitonin so let's go ahead and take a look at how this happens so the very first step that we had on the purple side 
was stimulating the activation of vitamin D. The exact opposite of that is preventing the activation of vitamin D. And that's exactly the first step that we have on the green side. The hormone calcitonin is going to prevent the activation of vitamin D. The second step is also the exact opposite of the other side. On the purple side, we said we're going to start telling the kidney, hold on to that calcium, put it back in the blood, don't let it leave through urine. Well, calcitonin is going to do the opposite. It's going to prevent calcium from being reabsorbed in the kidneys. It's going to tell the body, hey, we already have too much calcium. Don't put it back in the blood. We don't need it. Let it leave the body through the urine. We're also going to limit the amount that we absorb in our intestines. And then lastly, we're going to prevent the osteoclast cells from functioning. That way, they're not actively breaking down our bones. So again, purple side, go ahead and learn that. And then just reverse the actions so that you know the steps on the other side. So a little bit more information about calcium. Calcium is something that is actually not absorbed very well in our body. We only absorb about 30%. But the amount that we have as our RDA actually takes that into consideration. So if you are consuming the RDA and you have a steady supply of vitamin D, you should be getting enough uh, calcium in your diet. Now, if you didn't have enough calcium in your diet, or maybe you had enough calcium, but you weren't getting vitamin D, so that calcium wasn't being absorbed, the main way that we're going to see the deficiency is in your bones. Your bones are going to start to weaken and develop something called osteoporosis or other bone diseases where the bone mass is deteriorating and you are becoming... Um, your bones are becoming very frail and easily fractured and broken. Now, the best time to protect yourself from this is actually in your 20s. And the reason I say this is because once you leave your 20s, once you become older than that, your, bo uh, your body's basically not going to deposit any more calcium into your bones. So your 20s is your last opportunity to make your bones as dense as possible. Because as you get older, you start to lose bone. That's just the natural thing that happens. Osteoclasts start to work at a faster rate than the osteoblasts, which means the older you get, the mo more bone you lose. And that's something we really can't do anything about. It's just the aging process. But if you started off with really dense bone to begin with, as you go through that aging process, it's going to take you a lot longer to have weak bones. Whereas if you didn't deposit much calcium in your bones when you were in your 20s, once you get into the later years and you're losing bone, there's not going to be much bone to break down in the first place. And so you're going to start feeling the effects of weak bones a lot earlier in the process. So this here is showing us basically what I was discussing. So in the beginning of your, uh, of your life during childhood, at this point the calcium is really going towards modeling the bones into what they're supposed to look like, elongating the bones as the child grows taller. But once you hit your 20s, you're no longer growing taller. So now the calcium that's being deposited is just focused on making your bones denser instead of longer. So this is the period of time that you have the best opportunity to make your bones as dense as possible and prepare for the upcoming years. You see as we move on, starting off from the 30s onwards, the color starts to fade and that's showing us that bone loss gets more and more severe. A lot of times people tend to think that if they're past their 20s, it, it doesn't really matter anymore because their body doesn't deposit calcium into the bone, so there's no point in getting calcium in the first place. But what they're forgetting is that you still have to worry about your blood calcium. Remember, if your blood doesn't have the calcium it needs, 
it's going to start breaking down your bone to get that calcium. So we don't want that to happen. We want to make sure your blood is getting enough calcium from your diet so that your bones don't break down at a faster rate than needed. So that's what this picture is showing us over here. On the left, we have someone who has a calcium-rich diet. Their calcium-rich diet is depositing calcium into the bloodstream, and whatever is left over can go ahead and deposit in the bones if they're young enough. Otherwise, it'll just be released from the body. In the second picture, we have a diet that is not including much calcium. And so you'll see that the arrow going downwards is empty. So we're not getting any calcium put into the blood through food. So we have to get that calcium into the blood through another way. And the way that we can do that is by breaking down bone. So you see the picture at the very bottom on the right? That shows a much more porous bone, a bone structure that is not as dense as the one on the left. And that's because your body is relying on breaking down your bones to maintain your blood calcium instead of you giving your body that from your diet. So even if you're past your 20s, you still really need to make sure that you're getting enough calcium. So that is it for calcium. Let's go ahead and take a look at the next major mineral, which is phosphorus. Now, phosphorus we've seen before when we talked about our phospholipids. If you remember, we said phospholipids are a type of fat, and the phospholipids are actually um, part hydrophobic and part hydrophilic. The phosphorus that is attached to the phospholipids is what makes it hydrophilic. And we said that that unique property helps phospholipids transport our fats into the bloodstream. It also makes up our cell membranes as well and acts as an emulsifier in food products. So all of those roles are thanks to the fact that phosphorus is attached to the structure, making it part hydrophilic. So those roles belong to phosphorus as well. Another place that we saw phosphorus is when we talked about ATP, adenosine diphosphate. That is a form of phosphorus. And so another role is to help store energy in the form of ATP in the phosphate bonds. One role that we haven't discussed already is the role that it plays in our bones and teeth. That hydroxyapatite crystal that we said our body makes from calcium also contains phosphorus. Phosphorus is one of the major minerals that helps create that crystallized hard structure. Next we have magnesium and magnesium is found both in our tissues, in our bodily fluid, but the majority of magnesium is actually found in our bones. The reason that magnesium is primarily found in our bones is because, again, it's another mineral that helps make that crystallized structure that's called hydroxyapatite. But magnesium also has other roles as well. In the muscles, it helps the muscles contract. In the fluid, it helps um, with uh, blood clotting but it also helps in making ATP, so it's really important for energy metabolism. And the way that it does this is by helping the uh, ATP recycling process. Remember we said once you use ATP, one of the phosphates has broken off and released that energy and it becomes ADP. If we wanna go ahead and use it again, all we have to do is reattach a phosphate back onto the ATP structure, and now we can use it again. And magnesium is what helps add a phosphate to the structure once the original phosphate has been lost. So it helps us replenish ATP so that we can use it again and again. In the US, we don't tend to get enough magnesium, but since we do get some in our water supply, we don't reach levels that are low enough to actually form deficiencies. Toxicities are also not very common unless you are consuming supplements. Um, for example, if you've ever heard of milk of magnesia, sometimes is given to individuals who um, are constipated, but it can cause things like 
um, stomach discomfort, cramps, diarrhea. And so those are going to be the main symptoms that someone will see if they are taking magnesium supplements. Our last major mineral is sulfate, and this is one that we've actually seen before as well. If you remember when we discussed our proteins, we said that some amino acids require to be held together by um, sulfate in the form of disulfide bridges. Disulfide bridges are made from two sulfate units linked together. And some proteins need that extra structure, so they will have those, those disulfide bridges. So the main place where you're going to find sulfate is going to be in protein because of this. It'll be found in the form of disulfide bridges. Now, this is so plenty in foods in comparison to the recommendation that there is no actual number to follow. They haven't even made an RDA. They just say if you have a sufficient protein intake, if you meet the protein intake requirement for your body, then you should be getting enough sulfate.